Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. It is happening in more and more school districts. Impassioned parents facing off with school board members and each other over the issue of masks in schools, all while COVID cases among students climb. Tonight, another district in our area debating what it should do. The night team's John Paul Barajas at the Shirt Cibolo Universal City ISD board, board meeting as parents sounded off. <laughs> The debate of masks in schools bringing parents together at tonight's school board meeting with an overwhelming amount of parents saying, my kid, my choice. And many weren't happy this topic was even up for discussion. But according to a district survey, the overall majority is in favor of masking up. Church Cibolo Universal City ISD sent a survey to both parents and staff ahead of tonight's meeting. More than 6,700 parents filled out the survey. 64% of them with elementary or intermediate kids, those not eligible for a vaccine, are in favor of a mandate. It was slightly less, but still in favor for parents of junior high and high school students at just under 60%. The results were similar among staff. The right for you to not wear a mask ends when it affects my child. Among the 100 people who went up for public comment came a little rowdiness. Many questioned the district's findings, saying they believed it was skewed. Board members assured all parents with an email on file were sent the survey and even given an option for both parents to respond. There's 322 active cases in the district right now, mainly in students, and 121 are across eight elementaries as opposed to 93 cases in high schools. And right now, this board meeting is still going. It started at 6 p.m. The board meeting went into, or the board members went into a closed session at 8.30. That lasted about an hour. They're now back out on the public floor, continuing to discuss, but no verdict yet. I did hear two board members say they were against a uh, mass mandate, but again, no official ruling or verdict just yet. So as soon as we get that update, we'll let you know. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, John Paul. Governor Greg Abbott signing a new executive order to ban governmental entities from requiring the COVID-19 vaccine, even with full FDA approval. That includes the Pfizer vaccine, which got that approval earlier this week. Mayor Ron Nirenberg responding to that order today, calling it a head scratcher. Considering the fact that we have vaccine mandates for a lot of things to keep people safe. I don't know what his intentions are. Uh, they are clearly not what ours are, which are about protecting communities. The order also applies to businesses that partner with the state, but does not extend to private businesses and nursing homes. Tonight, Bear County continues to see more than 1,100 cases a day. According to the seven-day moving average, more than 1,300 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized. The mayor again saying Bear County was without ambulance service for several minutes today due to the high volume of calls. New tonight, arbitration for fired San Antonio Police Detective Daniel Pugh is scheduled to begin early next week. That's more than two years after he was fired following a family assault arrest. But as the night team's Dylan Collier reports, Pugh was never prosecuted, a trend in our area when law enforcement is accused of criminal wrongdoing. We do have a warning. This story describes dating violence and may be disturbing for some viewers. My, my, my mug just can go out on the news tonight. I'm not stupid. I know how this goes. That is off-duty San Antonio Police Detective Daniel Pugh in handcuffs in the back of a Bear County Sheriff's patrol vehicle. It's early January 2019. Pugh is about to be arrested for family violence, accused of standing over his girlfriend in the front yard of his far west side home and repeatedly punching her in the face. I should feel safe in my own house, but I know my own department it's going to hang me on it. While Pugh told a fellow SAPD officer who responded to the scene that he was trying to keep the woman from coming inside, he was likely unaware that his neighbor had not only called for help, but provided a dispatcher a six and a half minute account of the attack. Oh, she's bleeding. She is bleeding? 
Yeah, something knows. As oh it played God. out across the street. No, he just knocked her again. He hit her again? Oh, yeah. wow. Again. Oh, my God, how sad. Why, why take me today when there's no, there's no probable cause? Pew's repeated claims that he was no longer romantically involved with the victim took a big hit when a fellow officer walked into internal affairs and confirmed Pew had confronted him and the woman as they slept at her apartment. Next thing I know, Daniel Pugh walks into the bedroom. I am both shocked and very embarrassed. The encounter happened seven hours before Pew's arrest. You have your they are taking me then, right? Yes. Yeah, you're being arrested for, for, family, for assault, family violence. But by the time Pew came to court two summers ago, what appeared to be a strong case had weakened. The victim refused to cooperate with investigators, and the Bear County District Attorney had recused himself after realizing that one of Pew's relatives works for him. The special prosecutor then dismissed the charge against Pew after he completed an anger management class. So um, in the ordinary criminal case, the prosecutors and law enforcement are on the same side. But it gets complicated when a peace officer is accused of a crime, according to Donna Coltharp, an adjunct professor at St. Mary's School of Law and an assistant federal public defender. You know, they're on your team, they testify for you, you go to the same social events, um, you, uh, you believe yourselves to be uh, working for the same things, right? Take the case of Guadalupe County Sheriff's Deputy Christopher Locklear. He resigned in May, three weeks after an incident involving a teenage girl at his brother's home in Converse, where his brother happens to also work as a police officer. After we asked Converse PD for the report, a city official told us there were no records and later refused to provide it, even after we gave them the case number. Luckily, for transparency's sake, it was included in Locklear's discipline file and states that in late April, a teenage girl in his care was found inside his brother's house, unconscious, and laying in her own vomit. She had to be hospitalized. And while Locklear refused to come out and talk to officers who responded to the home, he later admitted to his supervisor that he had given the girl alcohol, a Class A misdemeanor offense. Four months after the incident, Locklear has not been criminally charged. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. And Locklear did not answer the door at his residence, but later sent an email incorrectly guessing how the Defenders found out about the incident. Pew, meanwhile, did not respond to a request for comment. His arbitration is slated to begin on Tuesday. One year ago today, military veteran Damian Daniels was killed by a Bear County Sheriff's deputy during a mental health check. Today, his family gathering at his home to honor his memory. Sheriff Javier Salazar has said Daniels reached for a weapon and was involved in a struggle with deputies before he was shot. Daniels family says they were able to view body camera footage from that day and they dispute the sheriff's account of what happened. Daniel's brother saying he is pursuing a wrongful death lawsuit and continues to ask the sheriff's office what type of discipline, if any, will be delivered to the deputies involved that night. My question to an elected official is when is it your job and your duty to provide these details to the American people and the people of San Antonio? The family also continues to call for the body camera footage to be publicly released. Following that shooting, the sheriff's office was criticized by Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, and later a mental health response team was created for the county. The countdown to September 1st means a countdown to new laws in Texas, and one of those laws will allow most Texans 21 years and older to carry a handgun without a permit. Current laws require Texans to have a license to carry, which includes a background check and training. The owner of Lone Star Handgun says the number of students in his classes has started to decrease into September. On a normal month, we teach between uh, about 200 people on license to carry stuff. Um, that's significantly dropped. We've had about a 60 to 70 percent reduction. While the license won't be required next month, Texans can still choose to go through the training for education and safety. There are still limits on where you are allowed to carry handguns, though. For example, a license is still required to carry on college campuses.
The timeline is tightening and the risk growing as evacuations ramp up in Afghanistan. The White House saying there are concerns a group that branched out of ISIS could create more challenges and chaos at the Kabul airport. Our Jaffany Gray with those concerns and how many Americans still need to be evacuated as we take a look at today's top stories. The U.S. working to meet Tuesday's deadline to complete the withdrawal from Afghanistan. As many as 1,500 Americans may still be in the country. The U.S. making contact with 500 of those so far before the rest. We're aggressively reaching out to them multiple times a day through multiple channels of communication, phone, email, text messaging. Lines of people continue to surround the airport in Kabul, and now a potential for chaos as the U.S. believes ISIS-K may want to create mayhem there. The group, an enemy of the Taliban, that is capable of and planning to carry out multiple attacks, according to a U.S. defense official. Here at home, one suspect arrested, another on the run in connection with a deadly shooting at a local bar. San Antonio police looking for this man tonight. Investigators say a fight inside the Boom Boom Sports Bar on South New Braunfels spilled out into a parking lot, leading to shots fired on August 15th. Two people hurt, three others killed. 34-year-old Daniel Bodigan arrested the next day. If you know where this second suspect is, call police. Meanwhile, the East Side Bar still not allowed to sell liquor for the next couple of months. And a world champion boxer fighting a felony robbery case against him. 31-year-old Jamal Charlo posting bond after turning himself over to authorities today. He's accused of assaulting a waiter and stealing her cash tips after his card was repeatedly declined at a bar on UTSA Boulevard last month. Charlo's attorney pushing back, saying his client became upset when the waitress lost his debit card. He denied his client took any money, but says Charlo did take back his license so it didn't get lost as well. He claims police moved forward with the case in an attempt to embarrass his client. Charlo was in town for his twin brother's fight at the AT&T Center. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. We are tracking the tropics tonight. Still ahead here on the night beat, Adam Kasky keeping an eye on whether this could be the next tropical storm and where it's likely heading coming up. And one state experiencing a drastic change in COVID-related deaths, plus a COVID-related kidnapping case unfolding in another state. Those stories next on the night beat. There's been controversy around the response to the pandemic by some state leaders. In one case, tensions rose so high, a plot was hatched to try to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Now, one of the men in that case cutting a deal with prosecutors. Ty Garbin sentenced to more than six years in federal prison after admitting to his role in that case and offering an apology. He's one of six defendants in the case. Investigators say the plot was formed after Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer placed restrictions on movement and the economy early on in the pandemic. Garbin says the men trained at his home for that plot. A prosecutor says Garbin is expected to be a star witness when he testifies against them in that trial. Meantime, in New York, new Governor Kathy Hochul announcing a, a reporting discrepancy added 12,000 more deaths to the state's count, positioning New York once again as a hot zone for COVID-19. An update now on the COVID-19 vaccines. Moderna now completing its submission for full approval to the Food and Drug Administration. The company is asking for a priority review, but that could still take months. An emergency use authorization allows people 18 and older to get the Moderna shot right now. The company also requesting emergency use authorization for children as young as 12. Pfizer got that full approval for its vaccine earlier this week for people 16 and older. Take a look outside tonight. Live cam here, 85 degrees. We actually had some rain to talk about and potentially some more, Adam Kasky. That's right. We have a few more rain chances in the forecast. We had a few downpours pop up earlier today, especially Atascosa County and some locations just east and southeast of San Antonio. So we will have more opportunities. Just don't get your hopes too high as they're going to be isolated in nature and coverage is not going to be all that widespread. We're also tracking the tropics. Of course, we've got the system that we're monitoring in the Caribbean that's going to move into the Gulf and then affect somewhere along 
the Gulf coastline. We'll take a look at the updated spaghetti plots from the computer models as they do indicate quite a shift this evening compared to what we saw even earlier today, as is to be expected this far out. So let's talk about it all, starting with our weather pattern. There's a look at some of those pop up showers that we had earlier today. Quick splash and dash. Some folks picked up just over a quarter of an inch of rain. So that was nice to see, and we're going to see the same trend here in the coming afternoons. Upper level high shifting northward. It's breaking down and weakening a little bit, and that's going to help us out just a little bit. We'll even have a few disturbances moving in from the east up above us. That's going to help us out. So tomorrow we'll start the day sunny. We'll have the typical patchy clouds into the afternoon, and then notice even our future cast at 3 o'clock popping up a few showers and thunderstorms, generally in random places. However, I will point out if you're in Lavaca County, Gonzales County, DeWitt County, Carnes County and points eastward toward the Gulf of Mexico, I think you've got slightly better chances than folks say closer to the Rio Grande. Nonetheless, you look at this into the afternoon and we'll just see some of those uh, isolated pop up showers and thunderstorms. Quick splash and dash garden variety, nothing severe, but you could get a quick quarter to half an inch out of it. Again, don't get your hopes too high because coverage is going to be limited. So we're talking isolated in nature, covering about 30% of South and Central Texas. And then notice into next week, I don't have rain chances in there right now because odds would favor us being on the dry side of this potential tropical system. But we are watching the tropics. It's far out. We still need to take into account the high degree of uncertainty with this system. So here's this cluster of unorganized rain and thunderstorms in the Caribbean. What we really need is this to get a well defined center of circulation. I don't mean like an eye of a storm, just a center to all this activity that then it will all circulate around because that makes it a lot easier to measure and it helps our computer model guidance to get a better grasp of the situation. We're trying to predict something that hasn't even formed yet. We're trying to predict a storm that's not even a storm, but this will likely turn into our next tropical cyclone. If or when it gets a name, it would be Ida and then traveling westward into the Gulf of Mexico. I mentioned the spaghetti plots and you still have to look at them a bit skeptically this far out, especially since we don't have a clear defined system to measure. Nonetheless, this is the latest tonight and it shows there could be a potential landfall anywhere basically from Texas, Louisiana border all the way to about Destin, Florida. So right now the spread is about a 350 mile difference. What we'll see is these come a little bit closer together in the days ahead, but also shift one way or the other. That's usually what we see. We'll keep you updated really quickly. Temperatures 97 today. We still haven't hit 100. No, we haven't. By this time last year, we had 29 100 degree days. Most of us in the 80s now 86 in San Antonio, 79 though in Rock Spring, Rock Springs, along with Rio Medina and Tarpley Converse at 82 tomorrow morning, 77 making it to 96. There's that 30% chance. So a little bit of activity popping up on the radar pretty much every afternoon all the way through Sunday and remaining in the mid 90s, which is average. All right, thank you, Adam. We've got some late breaking news. We're following out of the shirts. Cibolo Universal City Independent School District on that meeting about whether to require masks. The board voting to strongly encourage masks, but no mask mandate will be imposed. Again, it's strong encouragement, but there will be no requirement in the shirts. Cibolo Universal City School District. That is a vote of six to one in that meeting tonight. All right, let's turn to sports now. We have someone new to the roster, but not new to the team. Uh, you got that say. right. It's Brent <laughs> Forbes. He's back. He's coming back as an NBA champion, signed on the dotted line today. When we come back, you'll hear from Brent about returning to his former team. And Dak is back as well on the football field with his team throwing passes coming up. He's a cage lion. I mean, he's a competitor. He brings that competitiveness and, you know, an expertise to not in the quarterback position, but he makes the whole practice better. Dak Prescott participates in team drills for the first time since late last month. A big step in his return from his throwing shoulder injury in big board sports, but first. Our San Antonio Spurs made it official today. They have signed guard Brent Forbes to his new contract to return to the silver and black. In fact, they released this video of the NBA champion signing on the dotted line today. That's right after the NBA champ. He played for the Milwaukee Bucks last year before declining his player option to return. Now he's back in silver and black to help the Spurs improve to their three-point shooting since he was fourth in the league from long range last season. This is like my second home. You know, it feels, 
feels great to be back and um, you know in, 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 in the organization I started with and and learned a lot from and, and part of what what helped me grow in so many ways not just not just basketball but but in life um, I'm just excited to get get back to it and, and, and get back to work with these guys and, and um, you know try and do some good stuff Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dak is back taking snaps and team drills during practice for the first time since July 28th when he detected pain in his throwing shoulder. Frustrating for the star of the Dallas Cowboys, who spent nine months rehabbing from the worst injury of his football career. The compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle in week five of last season. Today, Dak completed 11 of 12 passes and 11 on 11 work at the team headquarters in Frisco. And according to reports, did not look hesitant on getting the ball downfield. He is working to be ready for the season opener against Tom Brady and the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buc Buccaneers on September the 9th. Now for the bad news. The Cowboys have added two new players to their COVID protocol list after both offensive linemen and backup center Connor Williams. Safety DeMonte Casey tested positive. That brings to six the total number of players in the NFL health and safety protocols for Dallas to go along with defensive coordinator Dan Quinn. Head coach Mike McCarthy says they will move to a more virtual format starting tomorrow, knowing there could be more cases. You ever how the you know the contact tracing goes and you know just we're, we're going to play the hot side of caution just like we have with everything so we take it very serious and you know we'll do what we need to do all right haynes king is the new starting quarterback for the fight texas aggies a 6'3 200 pound redshirt freshman from longview beat out sophomore zach calzada now head coach jimbo fisher revealed his decision today during his appearance on a houston radio station as king replaces former reagan high school star kellen mon mon led the aggies to 91 finish last year fourth overall in the nation before he was drafted by the minnesota vikings one of the biggest games in the state will be played on commerce friday night and our final big game coverage preview before the 2021 season kicks off tomorrow night next one of the biggest games in the state will take place this Friday night when the Judson Rockets host the DeSoto Eagles. There will be a showdown between two of the top 25 teams in the state in Class 6A, according to Texas Football Magazine. The Eagles come into this game after a 10-2 finish last year, finishing 5-1 in district, making it to the regional finals. Their best finish since winning the state title in 2016. The Judson Rockets, meantime, are looking to rebound after being knocked out of the first round of the playoffs last season by Roosevelt, 28-21. First time the Rockets have been eliminated in the first round since 2011. It's an amazing experience to play DeSoto and get to play teams that aren't from around here because it's a learning experience. We get to see different defenses, like get, our defense get to see different offenses. We get to learn more. We get to more experience for like people who haven't played before. I mean, it's a good learning experience for all of us. It's really important. We have to start off the season strong because that first game will carry out for the rest of the season. Our kids are competitors, just like we as coaches are competitors. And as a competitor, you want to play the best. So you get a chance to go against one of the best in the state and uh, see what happens. Be a great one. Kickoff and Commerce on Friday night is at 7 p.m. And now our final Big In coverage preview before the season kicks off tomorrow takes us to MacArthur High School, which is home to the Bramas. They'll be looking for their first victory under new head coach Kevin Hurst, who took over the football program last year and installed a new spread option offense. The Bramas went winless in the very difficult District 28-6A that includes such schools as Reagan and Johnson, running back Jonah Dunlap, that had 647 yards rushing, three touchdowns last season. We'll also see some time at quarterback and linebacker on defense. Definitely, we don't have those obstacles that we had last year, and uh, we've done many things that we couldn't do last year. And I feel like the way we're approaching this year can have a difference. We did have a good summer. I think we've made a lot of progress, a lot of work. Um, very excited. MacArthur will kick off their 2021 season against Marshall Saturday at 7 at Ferris Stadium. By the way, tomorrow is actually the first night of the high school football season. We'll have nine games and big game coverage, including our first live broadcast and our partnership with Texas Sports Productions on MeTV, which is 12.2 over the air. And that will start at 7 p.m. Madison against Clemens will be out there live at 5 tomorrow to get you ready for it. Nine games the first night. Just on the first night, yeah. Kicking off in a big way. About 41 the next night. Ooh, thanks, Greg. <laughs> we'll be right back. Tomorrow's going to be a lot like today. We'll have high temperatures, mid 90s, so 95 Canyon Lake, Gonzales 94, up to 100 closer to the Rio Grande, even down near Catula, Pearsall, and Dilly areas. Lackland 95 tomorrow, Timberwood Park 93, Bernie 92, some pop up afternoon showers and storms the next several days through Sunday. All right, thanks, Adam. That does it for the night beat. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good morning, San Antonio starts at 4 30 in the morning. Have a great night.